Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And today, we are thrilled to welcome the co-writer of a movie which is on many lists as being among the funniest of all time, Dumb and Dumber. Please help us welcome Bennett Yellen. Bennett, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And, and it's it's fun to talk about these things. <laughs> well, to, to start with, you, you grew up in California. Was your yeah. family at all into movies and the arts? Uh, my uh, yes, the answer to that is absolutely not. I couldn't. My family couldn't have been more removed from like the industry, or whatever. But my family loved movie. I mean, my parents. You know, I grew up in the '60s. You know, I, I'm in my mid '60s now. So, what was your babysitter when you were a kid <laughs> in the '60s? Yeah. But a TV, you know. And so, I was. You know, my parents were in my. I was plopped in front of a TV a lot, and, and so I loved television. I loved television, and then I lo we loved watching movies on TV. It was a big family event. Like, we would watch all the musicals, and, and we'd, we'd sit down, and we'd all watch it together. And so, and, But also, my parents took me and took my sisters and I to the movies all the time. I mean, they were, very, they were so cool about that. Um, and I remember the first movie I saw was a movie, I think it came out in sixty three or 64 called the wonderful world of the brothers Grimm. And it was this big cinerama based on the brothers Grimm. And we went to a drive in nearby in uh, our station wagon. And there's a scene where uh, buddy Hackett fights this stop motion dragon. And this is my first movie. I'm four <laughs> years old. I was so terrified. I crawled into the way, way back. I, I crawled into the back furthest corner of that and, and ducked down in that station wagon. It, traumatizing. Buddy Hackett traumatized me at, at four years old, and we won't go into that anymore. I'll just to let that statement stand. But, um, <laughs> I, I loved movie. I mean, even my parents were even so progressive. And this is odd because I was raised Orthodox Jewish. My parents let my sisters take me to see Bonnie and Clyde in 1967. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm eight years old. Oh my god! Watching, spoiler alert: uh, Warren Beatty and <laughs> Fade Out, and we get blown away at the end. And I, I remember that was traumatizing. It still traumatizes me. Oh yeah, I, I, that's I'm that's gonna, a rough interject film. One thing here. By today's yeah, standards, my, my, yeah. my dad took me to see. Uh, my dad took me to see what was the uh, oh the boys from Brazil. I was ten, and that yeah. pretty much did the same thing. Yeah, I mean, which which thank God, you know, it it it. it I, I I I had a tough shell that uh, you know of, of I could I could stand anything, but I loved movies and I loved TV and I loved trying to figure it out. Like I'd watch it and I'd try and figure it out. I, like it was like a magic show to me. It was exactly yeah. I was I, I was a magician. Yeah, like a magician. I did parties and stuff like that. And so oh, I tried, wow. how were, how was it done and all that stuff and, and um so so and in fact to me writing or making a movie a movie is a magic show too you're yeah. in the audience here's the screen here's the stage we're doing all this stuff behind the scenes you don't know what it is we just present you with this show <laughs> and you get the show and you know and and hopefully you think it's magical hopefully Abs absolutely i i I've, I've used that uh analogy myself <clears throat> many times because i find it i always found it magical and that's why i wanted to be a part of it so badly growing yeah. up but who were some of your favorite uh, comedic influences growing up as well as what comedic movies inspired you yeah all right there's okay i'm just gonna i'm just gonna put it out there and jerry lewis was big jerry lewis was big i i yeah. I, I, I just I'd see him and, you know, I, I think I, I actually saw The Nutty Professor in the theater. So mm -hmm. that may have been 65 or it may have been 60, 65 or so. And I just, and which that scared me too. When when uh, when The Nutty Professor turned into, uh, I can't remember the name of the, uh, 
the Dean Martin character. Yeah. I, it, it was a really scary, like it was scary. Like, like, like it was played like a horror movie and that frightened me, but I, I loved him and kind of wanted to be him. Marx Brothers, I loved. Uh, mm -hmm. Laurel and Hardy, loved Laurel and Hardy. Um, you know, I, there wasn't, I was trying to think of, a lot of those I saw on TV, you know, I, I, I didn't go to the theater to see them, but Jerry Lewis, I did go to the theater for, he was big, you know, but, uh, oh. yeah. When, when, did, when did you first discover that you had a talent for uh, writing and passion? I, you know, it's it's interesting. I, from from very young, I, I first of all, I was a voracious reader, loved to read. Uh, but then from very young, I wanted to write. I wanted to just put something on paper. And I started writing very young. I, I, I found papers that I, you know, you know story, like the beginnings of short stories. And it was almost very, very early. I, I recognized that that was some way for me to express the creativity that was going on in my head was through actually writing it. And uh, I know when I was in eighth grade, I decided I was going to write, you know, there was the Hardy Boys, and I liked the Hardy Boys series, but I was going to write a really hard-edged Hardy Boys. And, and so I decided, I, I wrote a short story, but it was a serial, and I'd read it every week in class to the, to the class. The teacher, this lovely lady named Miss Barbara Zussman would let me read it. And and so I, there'd be an installment every week, and at the and this was how hardcore it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was about two kids, and they discover that somebody is is sent, setting off bombs through sonic waves, which I called sanianic waves. I don't know why, but that's what what I called it. And and so the guy who's doing it figures out it's those kids and shoots one of them with with a shotgun and kills him. So it's <laughs> it's. It's the Hardy Boys, but but then it's the Hardy Boy. It's the hardcore boys. Away. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember I, I'm standing in front of the class reading this, and I look, I hear like a cry, like a whoop, and I look over, and there's Mrs. Zussman standing in the back of the room, <laughs> looking on in horror as I as the final episode. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Uh, so, but I always liked to write, and, and she encouraged me to write. And when I was in high school. I had English teachers who thoroughly encouraged me to write. And so I, I started I started writing then, way back then. And in fact, in high school, uh, so I graduated in high school in 75. So I guess I was a sophomore. I My favorite writer was William Goldman. William Goldman, who wrote The Princess Bride and Marathon Man, Academy Award winning screenwriter for... Uh, all the president's men and uh he won another one shoot he won it twice but uh, he wrote the princess bride and i love that book i thought that book was you know I'm, I'm, in, I'm a sophomore i read it loved it there's a character named a, a villain in the book named yellen you know and i was like I, I so i wrote him a fan letter and the fan letter said dear mr <laughs> uh, it, it went on and on <laughs> you know, and said, and you've got a character name, and I got a, I got an answer from him, and it was dated on my birthday of oh, 1975, uh, and it said, "Dear Mr. Yellen, I don't normally answer letters. I hate writing them." Oh, at the end of my letter, this was important. I wrote a P.S. I said, "P.S. Uh, you're under no obligation to answer this, but if you don't, I'll kill myself." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is 1975. <laughs> and then I get this response back and the letter said, Dear Mr. Young, I, I, I don't normally answer letters. I hate writing them. But after reading your note, I couldn't have you killing yourself either. He said, Thank you so much for the flattery. I'll try my best not to believe it. Sincerely, William Goldman. That's and awesome. That, isn't that awesome? That And that moment was, I want to be William Goldman. That's what I want to do. I want to write <laughs> movies. I want to write books. I want to be him. Uh, and that was the, he really inspired me. He was the one who I can directly say inspired me to be a screenwriter. Wow. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. You were so obviously prolific in high school. Did you write any, um, um, any things for high school productions? No, no, I, no. And, and never, nothing ever for stage. It was always mm -hmm. a, a short story or whatever like that. But uh mm -hmm. No. And in fact, I went to 
when I, I went to UCLA as an undergraduate and my, my BA was in fiction. And then I went to grad school for an MFA in fiction. And I thought I'll graduate. I'm going to get a corduroy coat with patches and a pipe. And I'm going to go teach writing in some university in the Midwest. You know, that's really, that was my plan. Didn't go that way, but that was my plan. Wow. <laughs> So you, you went to UMass, and, and that's where you met Peter Farrell, I was reading. So how, how did that come about? First day of class. <laughs> Don't forget, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I'm very, you know, sheltered, living. At, I lived at home even when I went to UCLA. But finally, I'm away from home for the first <laughs> time in my life. And I'm, every, you know, I'm like, my jaw, like, that's what a tree looks like. And it was all <laughs> so amazing to me. And the first day of school, the first class, uh, I'm sitting in in class, and and it, and Peter Fairley was sitting across from me. We didn't know; nobody knew each other. And we were supposed to bring a, a the first page of a short story we'd written to class that day, and we were going to go around the room and read our first pages. And the teacher, who was this a hefty guy named George Cuomo said, we're going to read each first page, and then we're going to see what we can assume about the story, the whole story from the one, the first page. Uh, and he said, but I have one, but I have one but, and it's a very big but. And I, he was hefty, and he did have a big but. And Peter and I stared across the table, our eyes locked across the table, we're like, we, st we started, you know, covered our mouth, and right after class, in the hall, I'm like, "What's your name?" I'm like, we knew, like, like a bad pun drew, drew us together. Gosh. That's how wow. we met. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and so we already knew we had the same sense. We found out very quickly we had the same sense of humor very quickly, and became oh, close, became that's, close friends. Yeah, it, and yeah, that yeah, that's, no, that, that's amazing. Um, th so it was meant to be, and and, and over the course of being in the program for three years, we decided at some point. Peter was from Rhode Island. He had no connection to the business either, like I didn't. Uh, and we said, let's write a movie. Let's. We both are <laughs> such a stupid sense of humor. Let's write a movie just to write it. And neither of us had written one before. And so we, over the course of a semester, we sat down and we wrote a script. It was called Dust to Dust. Very silly comedy about two idiots, strangely enough, who get a job working at a, a, a funeral home that's a shady funeral home that's actually smuggling drugs, you know. Uh, and now we have this script. What do we do with it? I mean, really? And, and we're coming to the end of our program. You know, we're getting our degrees. And it was Christmas. It was holiday time of 1984. Uh, and um, and Pete, Pete was on a date in New York. And the date said, you'll never believe who moved in next door to my parents in Alpine, New Jersey, Eddie Murphy. Oh, well. <laughs> wow. You ever see him? <laughs> and uh, she said, yeah, I, he, he, I saw him get his paper. So he made sure to give her, you know, actually hand her dust to dust. Back then, <laughs> the, there were no flash drives there. You can't email anything. Uh he handed her dust to dust. She called a few days later and said, you know, he was coming to get, he was going to get his, his mail and I ran across the street and handed it to him. Of course, I mean, I'm telling you something that can't possibly happen today. Yeah, no, no celebrity would be, would accept anything from a, a fan, you know. Meanwhile, I came home for the holidays, came back to Los Angeles and my sister my older sister, Freda. Yes, my older sister is named Freda. Just to remind you, the character of Freda Felcher in Dumb and Dumber is named <laughs> after my sister, who still dines out on that uh, that <laughs> honor. <laughs> so we, I, 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 my sister Freda would go Israeli dancing and, and folk dancing, and she knew David Zucker from folk dancing of the oh, wow. Zucker Brothers. And uh, and so I said, Freda, would you ask David Zucker if he would read our script, Dust to Dust? And she said, yeah. I, I, astonishingly, he got back to her and said, yeah, I'll read it. And I gave it to her. And 
Now that was December. Now we have to let's dissolve to May of 1985. We're I'm literally about a week away from moving back to Los Angeles, and you know, and then my father sends me, and I open it up. I'm still in Amherst, and I open up this this letter, and it's an article. I, I got it here, and the and uh, and he scrawled on the top. Is this your script? So this was in the Los Angeles Times, and it's an article. It was called the Eddie Murphy Script Derby, and it was all about. Everyone, Eddie Murphy was hot. He was, it was Beverly Hills. Top, he, he was, the, I think, the number one, you know, uh, box office star in the world. And it's all about everyone trying to write a script for Eddie Murphy. They, so here's, it says, on a recent Sunday morning, Eddie Murphy glanced out the living room window of his Alpine, New Jersey home and noticed a neighbor standing in the front yard. <laughs> They, they got this, they changed the sex. I don't know why. Under his arm, the man carried a script, a sight that made Murphy take a deep breath as he opened the front door. After chatting briefly, Murphy dutifully tucked dust to dust under his arm. Later that night on a flight to Houston for a concert, Murphy started to read. He liked what he read. It made him laugh. Now Murphy wants to option the story and the neighbor is on the verge of selling his first script to Hollywood. Oh, wow. <laughs> what happened? Uh, <laughs> They they were they couldn't find us. Paramount was trying to find <laughs> guys who wrote Dust to Dust, and they called every agency, and so they planted it in this article about Eddie Murphy, and, and hoping that the, they would call in at some point. And that's and we did call in. Meantime, my sister Freda calls me and says, "David Zucker wants to talk to you. Wants to meet with you. He really likes your script, and they'd like you to write something for them." This is how we got started in a way that can't possibly happen now and shouldn't have even happened back then. What's uh, it like in your mind that you're Eddie Murphy and the Zuckers reaching out to you and saying, oh, it's, we want it's to work crazy. With it's crazy. And that's, uh, they both did. We wrote something for Eddie Murphy, which never got made uh, because he wanted to direct it uh, and they wanted him to star in it. They wanted, they, uh, you know, oh. Paramount wanted him to keep starring in movies and keep making cash for them. And he wanted to, do different things, and they were trying to put him back in line. And the Zucker, <laughs> the Zucker's a couple of projects that didn't get made, um, including the one, the feature that we wrote. But that, they started us out. And I, I'm, I, here's, wow. Years later, I, and this is so such a funny little postscript. Um, I saw David Zucker. I hadn't seen him in years, and and I said, David, you, know, you realize that you kind of you. I, I owe my whole career to you. You were gracious enough to read dust to dust and he said ah oh, you know i really wanted to date your sister <laughs> <laughs> and so i'm like i don't care what what the know, reason is <laughs> what the reason was i don't oh. think they, i don't think they all would have gone to the trouble of hiring us multiple times <laughs> it was only because of that oh my gosh well i hope david doesn't hear that yeah. <laughs> He's tomorrow's I, guest. I, 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 I love <laughs> this stuff. I swear to God. Thank that's that's fantastic. Yeah. So, what are your earliest credits as listed um, as writing for Paul Reiser, who we both yeah. love, and yeah. he already had appearances in several huge movies at that point. How did you hook up with him, and and how was it to see your work on a TV special? That was a thrill. Uh, you know, we had agent. The first, in fact. We didn't have agents when we came to town. Yes. And the first agent, to, this first person to contact us uh, was somebody named Richard Lovett, who was working for a, a kind of a new agency called Creative Artists Agency. And Richard is now the head of Creative Artists, <laughs> has been the head of Creative Artists for like, what, 20 years or something now. Uh, so we had agents and and they, they, they'd they send us out on things. And I can't remember how we, I don't remember how we got the Paul Reiser special, but as you like an actor, you know, when people say, when people read articles and, and they say, you know, like, 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 like Ike Eisenman took the role of, uh, from Escape Room, and it's, it's, yeah. it doesn't, it's not, we don't take the role. We have to, we have to go in, <laughs> we have to audition, we have to prove that we're worthy of, of taking the role. Right. And so, you know, a writer is always, every, every it's always an audition to try and get that. So I cannot remember 
how we got it, but we pitched it to Paul. And what we, what we pitched was because this was an HBO special. And it was it was nineteen eighty you know six. I I think it, it aired in eighty seven maybe. Um, and at that time, everyone was doing sort of these straightforward HBO specials, comedy specials where they're just on a stage and they're performing their, their, their stuff. And we said to Paul, what if we wanted to like a wrap around a story, like, like that's going on around you. That's not you on the stage and you on the stage is in the middle of it, but there's a whole tale. And then you stop and you do your show. And then there's more that, that wraps it up. And he said, I like, I like that very much. It's, it's good. I like that. So, and he was so, what a sweet guy. So we wrote it. And it was uh, it was directed by Carl Gottlieb, who great oh. Carl Gottlieb, uh, co-writer of The Jerk and Jaws. I, I just think he's a tremendously talented guy. And it had such a, it had an incredible cast because Paul has all these friends like Carrie Fisher and. Mm. I am check it on IMDb. It's oh, I did. We were going to ask you about that. Look, I mean, look at the cast you had. You had Kelsey I know. Hammer, Woody Tom. Harrelson, Carrie Fisher, Elliot Gould, Terry, Terry Gar, Carol Kane. So, <laughs> I would watch what, that. So, what, what uh, stories do you have about them? It was them? it was thrilling, and this is the first thing that we actually were on set for uh, because Carl was gracious enough to let us wander around. Uh, and and it was I can it was thrilling it was thrilling to see your words coming out of of, of amazing actors mouths and uh, mm -hmm. it was such a it was a really a, a spoiling experience although once Peter and Bobby started directing movies uh, that was also spoiling when you co-write <laughs> something with the director it's like a you get to do all you get to have all the fun without any of the stress. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Just let somebody else take care of that part of it. But it was very, very exciting. And and in fact, the, the producer, the co-producer of that special, Charlie Wessler, ended up being the producer of Dumb and Dumber. So oh, wow. that was a, a, an important connection that we made, a, a, you know, with wow. Charlie. And but it was it, it was a thrill. I, I to answer your question, unbelievable thrill. You know, uh, and I I was so. I, I didn't understand the protocol of it. And so I, I was like, like so polite that I wouldn't approach anybody and talk, you know, like I was nervous about doing something wrong. So uh, I was very kind of watching. I took, I took tons of Polaroid shots. I mean, not during the, not when they were shooting. But, uh, yeah. Uh, and so I have a lot of documentation of all the scenes and oh, hanging. That's, awesome. that's great. It was great hanging out with Lance Henriksen, but everyone was really nice. It was so much fun and a thrill, a thrill to take, be part of. Yeah. Well, jumping to Dumb and Dumber, um, I was reading that it was originally a John Hughes concept. Uh, I mean, he's such a legendary filmmaker. How how did that evolve to a point where you and the Frellies became involved? Well, what happened was we had... John Hughes had a, a production deal at Universal, and we were writing a movie at Universal. Uh, it was going to be a sequel to the uh, Dragnet, the the, the that with uh, Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd. Uh, they were, they, were gonna, they wanted to do a, a Dragnet too. So I, I think that's how John somehow read our script because. Mm -hmm maybe they were talking about it it came out really well it was very we, we it was really funny it's too bad they didn't make it but uh and so he called us in and he said you guys are funny I, I read your script he said I, I I have I have this like idea for two he gave us a few pages uh, of, of, of literally it was just two guys at a ski resort I remember one of them jumped in the pool and it was frozen. So that was what, you know, but it was that kind of thing. And there was no, there was no plot. It was just pages. And he said, look at this stuff, see what it inspires in you. Come back to me and pitch me a movie. And we're like, okay, all right, fine. We came back, we pitched it to him. He said, that's hilarious. I love it. Go and write it. And if I like it, I'll let you direct it. That was, we were like, Wow. Oh my Your wish is our command. <laughs> so we went away and we wrote Dumb and Dumber. Now here's what happened. This happens a lot. When uh like when a production deal at a studio ends, 
and it's not renewed and the person, whether it's a writer or director, or when they move on, all the material that they had developed at that studio just right goes into a crevasse or goes into storage and that's the end. It does, and it can't, the studio doesn't develop it because the person is no longer there with them. And so uh, that's what happened with Dumb and Dumber. It just sort of disappeared because John left and went to uh, to Fox to do Home Alone. When I do that, when I do that, is that automatic? When the, I don't the know. That just suddenly, like, yeah. yeah. It is. Okay. I have no idea. Oh, my God. Now I'm terrified to make any gestures. I've never seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, hold on. I just let me see. <laughs> <laughs> no, didn't work. Okay, I had to, you oh, know man. everyone wants to try that. Um, so we went back to to John and we said, John, could we take Dumb and Dumber and take it around and try and set it up? You know, and he said, Yes, you can. He gave us permission, but he said, But you can't. I'm not going to produce it, and you can't use me, my name to set it up. So if you or if you do, you have to pay me a million dollars. And we said, Well, there's a million dollars we just saved on the budget. Oh so. wow. That, so that, and that's how it happened, you know. And and for for, you know, for many years it wasn't it was sort of like not known about the genesis of it. But but uh, yeah, he got he was the one who gave us that start. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Well, so you you've got the script now. We have the script, right? How, how difficult was it to to get put into production? Oh, other than being rejected by every studio three times, not difficult at all, you know? <laughs> Other than that fact. You now, what happened was we sent it everywhere under Dumb and Dumber. Uh, I, I, at that time, there was, no, there was not a dumb genre of movies. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with you on that. But... <laughs> uh, not, not an, not an, intention, not an intentional yeah. one. Right. There were stupid movies, but it wasn't right. like yeah. that. <laughs> studios weren't making them intentionally because yeah. they made money. Uh, and so uh, we said, well, let's... And also, the other thing that 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 weighed down the possibility of anything happening with it was we because John had gotten us so revved up about the idea of we could direct it, We uh, Peter was attached. We were sending it around oh. with Peter <laughs> attached as the director. He had not, he had not even... It never directed anything, so it really it it made it even less appealing. For, you know, <laughs> like what these? What's this dumb script about stupid people called Dumb and Dumber? And one of the writers is attached, who's never done anything. It couldn't have been a less appealing pack, <laughs> you know. Um, so we said, well, let's because what happens is uh, studios will when they get a script back, then they cover it. Uh, if someone was assigned to read it. And write a, a, a like a quick little few page review and recommend it or not. It's called coverage. So we said, well, it's been covered under Dumb and Dumber. Why don't we change the name of it? <laughs> send it out again. See what happens. I mean, how often can it be rejected? Probably was the question we were asking. <laughs> so we changed it twice. We sent it around two more times. Uh, once under the title Go West, and then finally, oh, there they go. <laughs> Double, double? I don't know. Oh, oh, what the? Oh, wow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Now you know how to make the fireworks explode. Just absolutely two thumbs up. Um, <laughs> we sent it out under Go West, and uh, this is going to sound weird, but we meant it to sound weird. There was a, a group, and I cannot remember the name of the, the group, called like either the New Americans or something. And they had a song called A Power Tool Is Not a Toy. And we said, ooh, that's kind of an intriguing title. I, I, why don't we call it A Power Tool Is Not a Toy? <laughs> so we slapped that on and we sent it around and it was routinely rejected over and over again. Until, until uh, a little company, these two guys, it was almost like it was an independent company. That were making very small movies uh, called the Motion Picture Corporation of America. Uh, they're the two owners, uh, Brad Pervoy and Steve Stabler. They read Dumb and Dumber. They thought it was hilarious, and they because they were so low budget, they were like, oh, "We don't care." Beats attached to it. Sure, why not? And so they were the ones who first said, "We'll do it." Once they said that, and I, this is the part that I still don't understand 
how it got to Jim Carrey, how Jim Carrey read it first. But someone at New Line, New Line had just made the, the mask with Jim Carrey. Oh. Someone at New Line uh, got him the script and he loved it. And he told, New, he said, I want to do this. And once he was involved, because New Line had just worked with him, New Line contacted Motion Picture Corporation and said, we will co-produce this movie with you guys. And that's how it came about. It was <clears throat> fairly attached and that's how it came about. Well, I, I saw. I was reading there were all these other names that were under consideration for us, like you know Steve Martin, Martin Short, Nicholas Cage. <laughs> I can't even see. But uh, how, so, were you involved in that process, seeing these names possibly attached, and were you disappointed, like each one kept turning it down? Or I, I was. I remember, this would have been the first feature that that all three. Of, by the way, like like uh, we haven't mentioned Bobby Fairley, but Bobby was not. Uh, Peter and I started writing originally together and bobby would read our scripts you know and give us great notes but he, but he wasn't he wasn't a writer but his notes were great and while we were doing dragnet 2 pete said to me what if bobby joined us as a writing team and i said he's fantastic i love him i love his notes yes so that's when bobby came, came and joined us and that and that's and soon after the next i think we did a couple of things before we ended up doing uh, writing all, all all of us writing dumb dumber together, but uh, yeah. So th they were they were throwing all sorts of names. I remember, and and I, it's interesting to read articles because I, I wasn't aware of some of them. And and but I remember Jim Jim really wanted Gary Oldman, which would have been <laughs> very interesting. And and I mean, it, it's not when I think about it, it's not that straight. You know, if you're gonna Bring Jeff Daniels in. Gary Oldman is equally, uh, you know, uh, a possibility. If, if, once you're thinking outside the box of not, you know, New Line wanted like like Sinbad wanted another comedy co comic, like Carrie was, and we were like, you know, it's get an actor because an actor will will move an actor will move Jim more toward the acting side. And Jim will probably move the actor more toward the comedy side. So, um, but nobody wanted Jeff Daniels. And Jeff Daniels was routine, not just turned down by every like, like no one, but they they lowballed him in order to make sure he passed. And he read the script and he thought it was hilarious. His managers, oh, they they were not happy that like, up until the up until he left to to shoot it. They're like, are you really going to go into this? Even even up until, I remember when we were showing a first cut of it to one of Jeff Daniels' managers, and he was sitting right next to me. And I have to admit that the 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 bathroom scene, the toilet scene, was went on longer in that cut. It was there. There were some more things going on, and I I I, I get it. There's a tap on my shoulder, and I turn, and his face is white. He says. You're cutting all this, aren't you? <laughs> I said, we're cutting it. Yeah, don't worry about that. Um, but we we loved Jeff Daniels, loved him. We uh, we were big fans of the movie Something Wild, the Jonathan Demme movie Something Wild. And he so the first half of just Something Wild is a comedy, uh, like a romantic comedy, and the second half gets darker. But we just thought his reaction shots in that movie in the first half, he was so good. I also was in the Purple Rose of Power. I mean, the guy was a yeah. Oh, oh yeah, such a great actor. We loved it. We thought he we we thought he'd be great in it. So I'm, we're so like everything else that happened in my career. The way this movie lined up and the way it ended up being and the and the the way it ended up being a hit and then beyond being a hit, entered the zeitgeist as a cult movie. It just lucky. Well, at what, what point did you did you start realizing that what you had there while you're filming? I mean, at what point during the filming did you say this pairing is really good? Oh, right away! Right, right away! away you got, right yeah. away, you'd see the footage, you'd see them together. Right away, right away. Uh, um, I mean, and so, but, but I'll tell you that, and 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 when we were when we cut it together, and then we started previewing it, and it was pre it previewed great. And don't forget at this point. Jim Carrey, we're now in like 1994. 
uh, when that was his big year because that's when Ace Ventura came out and then The Mask and then Dumb and Dumber came out in December of 1994. And so each one just sort of pushed the other one into a bigger hit. Oh, well. and, um, and so I remember The Mask was released in the summer of 94 and we had a trailer for Dumb and Dumber before The Mask. And I would go to movie theaters to watch the trailer before The Mask started and watch the audience and they were just they would respond so strongly. And I remember thinking, and then I, I have no, you can't make a hit because if you could make a hit, everyone would make a hit. <laughs> you know, movies are hits for a whole bunch of reasons, but not all of them are. And so, and I remember thinking in my naive way, when I watched the audience react to that trailer, I think we have a hit here. I mean, I think it's going to be a hit. And, and, and we were once again lucky. We were the third of oh. his movies released that year, and it was it was such a big hit that it was a hit into 1995. Like like you know it because it came out in December of 94. And I remember calling. Uh, it was like number one even into 1995. Which nowadays you know like movies are they come out or they stream and they're gone. Like and in, in, even a hit is gone in two weeks. You know it doesn't stick around for long. Uh, but back then, movie if it was a hit, it'd be around. It would be a hit for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And so I called up New Line. And I said, "This is your chance for a great uh, ad that says number one movie in America two years in a row." <laughs> <laughs> and they ran it. I oh my god, that's fantastic! <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's fantastic! I have that newspaper somewhere in storage. <laughs> oh god. Well, yeah. during production, was there a lot of? ad-libbing between the the stars <laughs> here's the thing because I, and I think that they they were gracious enough to 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 do this because it was the first time that peter and bobby b both co-directed it although peter i think is credited I, I think i can't remember if they changed the credit to peter and, and bobby but they they both co-directed it don't director's guild do not come contacting them and, and <laughs> throw them out this was years ago uh, but because it was their first movie, everybody was so cooperative. Everyone was so, you know, those guys are, are incredibly uh, likable, friendly guys. And on the first day, they were like, you know, we haven't made a movie before. This is a team effort. If we all do our best, it makes the best movie. Let's make the best movie. And, and instantly the crew and the actors are on their side. So um, so the bottom line is that they would do the script as written and, and they would always make sure that there were there were solid takes of it as written. And then what are you going to do if, if Jim Carrey comes up and says, I got an idea. Can I try this? What are you going to say? No, yeah. it's Jim Carrey. Yeah. So so when when he would have suggestions and often he'd have it before, you know, like have the suggestions before we'd shoot, you know, and we sat down with him, in fact, well, and asked him, what would you like in the script? Like, are there jokes you want? Are there scenes you want? And he gave us notes and said, and so we tried to add things that he wanted. But if he had a suggestion, go for it. So, but but it wasn't, but they stuck to the script. I mean, there, there wasn't, as you know, it, like improv, you can't, you can't just pull improv on, on, on a, on a set, it's, it's, somebody's got to know that that you're going to try it at least, you know. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask you. As a writer, it's like you know, you're thinking, "Stick to my lines." I work part of this. Does that come to your mind, I, Jonathan? As a writer, I, I I'm not thinking. I'm I'm that I'm like, whatever makes it better, right. bring it on. <laughs> you know, everyone's going to think I wrote it anyhow. So you. you <laughs> <laughs> I, I get the pleasure of the credit, but uh, oh no, it's it's all about. I I you know I never now again the, the the it can go in the opposite way you know where if if what's what they're trying does isn't as good as what what we think we've written <laughs> then yeah go go with what we've written but uh, oh no to me the bottom line is is for me is always what's the best what's the best scene what's the best line what's the best movie you know yeah. Uh, well Jim Carrey and Lauren Holly um, actually got married in real life after the film. Did you notice their attraction uh, during filming? I um, I noticed their attraction uh, at the audit when she came in. When she <laughs> came in, they had met before, uh, so that it wasn't the first time they had met. 
Uh, I don't, if I remember correctly, but it was, it was palpable. That's why the word palpable was invented for, for that, <laughs> with her audition. So yeah, uh, you could sense it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there, there are a lot of little stories going around about this movie. And I, I do have to ask about one of them that I was reading. Okay. You shot at the shine at the Stanley hotel with a shining one, the famous one. So one of the stories that circulates is that Jim Carrey checked into the famed room, you know, 217, and checked out shortly afterwards. So was that true? I heard, yes, I heard that was true. And, and that and, was true. And would not talk about, wow, but not talk <laughs> about why he checked out. So and I heard, wow. I heard that that was true. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that did, great? Did, did you have any weird experiences at the, I, at the hotel? I wasn't, I wasn't at the Stanley for the shooting. So, oh. Uh, oh. My yeah. weird experience was not being there. <laughs> <laughs> what other what other behind the scenes stories do you remember from the making of that film? Oh God, it's tough. It's easier for me to remember everything because it was so much more recent from Dumb and Dumber Two. But I wasn't. We'll get there. <laughs> I wasn't on set for. I wasn't on set for a lot of shooting Dumb and Dumber. I was. All, I was very much in the editing room for it. But wasn't on set, and you know, when I look back, I'm like, I could have, I could have been more. I could have asked to be, but again, <laughs> I wasn't sure about the protocol. Like there was nobody sat me down and said, you know, you, you're you, as a writer, and and certainly the protocol of having co-written it with the directors. I could have been all over it, it had, you know, had I realized that I could, uh, and and and, and it, you know. Uh, embedded myself because it, it wouldn't I, but back then I was thinking like oh I should let them do their thing and they're probably so nervous trying to direct this and so I came and visited uh, a little bit but and, and was there for some you know some shooting and and was there I was there when when just when Jeff Daniels had just arrived and was uh and I remember he said he said he's got he's gonna blow me off the screen this is before he like really started shooting oh because his first day the first shot was one part of the montage the, the, with the snowman with with Mary and the snowman and Pete and Bobby said here take the carrot and put it where you know down low and he said really <laughs> like like, <laughs> like and they said yeah that this is this is that kind of movie and and that was sort of his initiation but he was like uh, I think Jim's gonna blow me off the screen he's so he's so hilarious in this and I said Jeff. I, you have you have all the big laughs in the movie. You have most of the big laughs in the movie are yours. So don't <laughs> worry about that. And then at that point, like like several days in, he was completely into the energy of it, the fun of it, and and there was no worry. You know, he wasn't concerned <laughs> at all about you know, they had, they had, their rapport was established, and that wasn't the concern of his at all. Mm. Yeah. Well, so the film comes out and becomes a huge hit. Um, did that start changing your life in any way? Yes, I became severely addicted to drugs. <laughs> no, Ike didn't laugh at that. Jonathan <laughs> did, but Ike didn't. Um, yeah, it, 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 changed my, <laughs> it changed my life in the sense that, uh, and you'll have to Google me to find out whether that was true or not. No, um, <laughs> In the sense that, yeah, it was a huge success, and uh, as a writer, you know, you absolutely, it's a wave that you're now writing, you know, R I D I N G, and so yeah, I mean, I mean, and it, and it, it's and it continues to not change my life, but it, it it continues to impact me because it, I, I say this all the time, you know, move, think of how many movies get made, uh, and think of. How many movies for, have been forgotten? And then think of movies, even Academy Award winning movies that have gotten made and won Academy Awards and have been forgotten. I mean, there's just an endless amount of them. But now think of movies that are still remembered and are still quoted, you know, years later, and it gets to be less and less and less. And in, inexplicably, Dumb and Dumber is this has become this cult movie that's part of the zeitgeist. It gets quoted, you know, it gets quoted yes. all the time. 
particularly sports shows like to quote it like you know like so you're telling me there's a chance when, when a team is is like the odds against the team are so intense uh and you can't you can't make that happen you can't create a, a rocky horror picture show it, it's it 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 just happens for some reason and dumb and dumber is a stupid movie that just delivers a lot of stupid laughter somehow thank goodness laughter is always in season and i i think that it also is multi-generational because there were you know it was aimed directly at teenagers like like and or, or 13 year old boys <laughs> that that was the 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 arrow that was the the target that we were trying to shoot the arrow into and then 13 year old boys grow up and a lot of them get married and have kids and so they show them to their kids and then their kids have kids and now you got the grandparents and the parents and the kids all watching Dumb and Dumber. It's 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 multi-generational now. Mm -hmm. I, I think with the 13 year old boys they age but not necessarily grow up. So it's two yeah. different things. <laughs> so, yes. How, yeah. how did you how did you get involved with the cartoon after? Um well what happened was they they were like excited about the idea that it, it was already in, in, in motion and in progress and they had they had a, a showrunner and all that stuff. I had not done anything. I had no experience with cartoons or whatever, but I got a call saying, would you, I think maybe Peter called me and said, Bennett, do you want to maybe work on the cartoon and just like be the showrunner? Now I had never, I, I had no experience in this field whatsoever, zero, you know, <laughs> and this is a field where it really requires somebody who has had the experience and sort of matriculated through the whole staff writer to writer to producer to show. It, it requires a pathway to get there. And they just dropped me into, I mean, thank, thanks to them. I mean, I met and I said, I want to do it. And they dropped me into it. And I was could not have been could not have been less qualified. I, I was I, it was it was it was not a great fit, you know. And so I immediately tried to hire all my friends to write episodes. <laughs> I said, well, as long as I'm here before I, I'm tossed, I'll at least get everybody an episode, which is what I <laughs> pretty much kind of what happened. Um, but I, I I recognized it was not for me. I, I wasn't there very long. I was probably there for maybe six to eight months, and then. Uh, they got the right people who knew how to do it. And then it, it didn't last long either. But uh, I, I was, I, I mean, I'll say that very, you know, I was way out of my league on that. So, mm. yeah, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few years after the original Dumb and Dumber, a prequel was made when Harry met Lloyd. Now, yeah. none of you really had any involvement in that. Were you were no. you even asked? And and what was your feeling about seeing other filmmakers do things with characters that you helped to create? Yeah, we we were asked. New Line came to us and said, "We want to make a, a prequel." And we were like, "Did you say prequel, not a sequel? Like like <laughs> prequel? That's before." So. Is it supposed to? Be, and they said, yeah, it's supposed to be Harry and Lloyd, like in high school, or, or you know, younger Harry and Lloyd. And we were like, yeah, you know, <laughs> the whole thing that makes Harry and Lloyd funny is that they're adult adolescents. You know, they're not. It's, it's that they're adults and they act like kids. If they're young and they act like idiots, it's not funny to us. So we begged out on that, and and mm. we, we said no. And I think, you know, you can in a situation like that, you're offered sort of a um a like i took an they said do you want to be listed as the executive producer on it and i was like i don't sure why not i mean if it was a hit it's, it was not a bad thing to have my name slapped on but it's it's just really more like a prestige title and pete and bobby who were busy with their career right you know doing other movies said no we don't need that and they didn't put their name on it but uh yeah and then i read the script and I was like, oh, this just this is not good. And, mm. and and I was like, well, this is, I mean, it just felt like a disaster to me. So and then when it, it, it was not a good movie. And so we had I had so neither none of us, none of the three of us had any creative involvement whatsoever. The most, you did see it after 
The most creative, I, I did, I don't think they ever saw it. The most creative involvement we had was them saying no to the credit and me saying yes. That was, that was it. <laughs> Well, I want to talk briefly about the show Unhit. Uh, it was a family show, and you wrote for for it. Great leads, Craig Bierko and uh, Rashida Jones. Yeah, so it didn't run long, but has a lot of fans still. What are some of your memories about the show, and and why do you think it didn't last long? It was it, another another experience where I was so blessed. Because the people involved, the creative people involved in that were so nice. And the writer's room was so nice. I had never been in an actual, in an actual writer's room on a sitcom. And, and, and the reason I, I had avoided a sitcom all, and tried to stay in features and writing features over the course of my career was I, I'm just a lazy Jew. And, uh, and, I, and I just didn't want to be... Uh, in, in a room until two in the morning working on you know a script and i knew that that's what the schedule was when you were uh you know in a writer's room on a sitcom and then this but this came around and, and, and at this point i was writing with another i would always written with somebody else i've never written by myself i've never wanted to write by myself mm. my mentor william goldman said the loneliest thing in the world is a writer going into a room by themselves and closing the door and sitting down at the typewriter. It's, you know, it's, you're just on your own, but if you're a co-writer, if you, if you're a collaborator, you get to hang out with your friend all day. You get to make jokes for 35 minutes out of the hour and then work for 25 minutes. You know? um, and so I love tossing an idea taking an idea and tossing it, you know, and then having it come back, you know, reshaped and then throwing it back, reshaped again. I, I, that's a, that's joy to me is the fun of, of collaboration. Uh, so it was time, my, the writing partner I was working with at that time, James Johnston, we were like, let's do it. Let's be, let's be on a show. Let's, let's be in the writer's room. And it was, God, we had so many great people. The, the, the show runner of it, uh, was had been the showrunner of Friends. The cast was great. I mean, Rashida Jones was coming off of The Office. Uh, and uh, I remember, you know, the, the actors come in and you meet them. They're meeting the writers. You know, it's like everyone wants to charm each other because we're going to be writing what they're going to do. And, and she said, like, guys, just don't write me on a series of bad dates, which is exactly what we did. <laughs> And, and no offense to her, she was absolutely <laughs> so charming and sweet. Uh, but it was it was a blast. It was so much fun to write. I watched the show at the time. So. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think only like four, three, three episodes aired, okay, okay. and then the strike. What happened with us was the strike happened. The, the strike of two thousand and seven happened, and that shut us down. So. We wrote, I think, four, four or four episodes. We shot three. We were going to shoot another one, and we had another one written, and then we had to stop for the strike, and then it never. I mean, that's what happened to the show, and, and uh, I guess, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it was a blast. Definitely. Everyone was great. That the crew, the the, the producer, all the creative elements of that show, they were wonderful. At the, what was what was it was this is awkward, but. James and I had also, at the same time, simultaneous to working on Unhitched, we'd also gotten a job to write the sequel of a, of a horror movie called uh, Joyride. It, 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 there was a movie called Joyride that J.J. That, that Abrams wrote, a really good thriller. And Fox wanted to do a direct-to-DVD sequel to it. And so James and I got hired to that. So we were writing that simultaneously as we were working on uh unhitched and we'd have to, and they were shooting it like and when we'd have to go into our office sometimes and work on that and we and it was it was awkward because we knew that everybody knew that those two guys are also going in their office and working on that it was just a it was <laughs> sort of but but everyone was kind to us everyone was nobody gave i mean i, I can see from their point of view how how weird it must have looked that we you know we disappeared yeah. <laughs> in our office. I mean, it wasn't. We were always in the writers' room when we needed to be there, but we disappeared from the office, and 
and go in and we we had to like rewrite the whole ending because we got a call from the set that it wasn't working so and they had to cut the budget and so um so that was weird that that was going on simultaneously but oh. so, wow yeah well, we wanted to touch upon stuck on you um starring matt damon and greg kinnear yeah. um which also had a cameo by one of jonathan's favorites share <laughs> yes um, <laughs> how did that come about and, and what are some of your memories and behind the scenes stories uh, of that film I'll tell you how that came about. It, 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 it's very simple. I had seen this bizarre cult movie called Chained for Life. And Chained for Life starred a couple, uh, like these actual conjoined twins, the Hilton, Daisy and Violet Hilton. They were conjoined, I think, at the, I can't remember which part, but, uh, and Chained for Life is a cult movie because it's ridiculous. It's it's laughable. They They play two sisters and one and each one falls in love with like one of them falls in love with a with a real rotter a real bad guy and the bad guy abuses her and the other one accidentally kills him so they both go on trial for his murder and i, I said to pete and bobby I, after watching i said guys i just watched the most ridiculous movie and i, and I said we should do a comedy about Siamese twins. I mean, we call them Siamese twins now. Oh, Excuse sorry. me. If there are any conjoined twins <laughs> out there, I'm I apologize for you know. We can edit that out if you want. <laughs> the incorrect term. Uh, and then that's what that that's what set it off. And and I I worked on the story of, of stuck on you with them. So I, I get story credit on it. But uh, and then I worked on on uh, they would have punch ups. Uh, where we get like a, a writer's room together and punch it up, but I didn't, I didn't directly co, I didn't directly co-write that with them, so I'm only credited as story. But um, by the way, Jonathan, the share part was originally going to be Jack Nicholson. I mean, oh, I'm like, glad you did share. <laughs> it was written for Jack Nicholson, and so the plot was written for Jack Nicholson too. And and at one point he was maybe going to do it and didn't do it. And then Cher said yes. And so that had to be rewritten. And then the best part is this. It was going to be Woody Allen. Woody Allen was going to- Oh, I think, wow. Yeah, I cannot remember who, or if they got this, if they had the co-star, but Woody Allen had agreed to do it. And he said- Really? Yes, yeah, yeah. And wow. he said, and we were going to explain the difference in age, because it was going to be like, it was going to be Matt Damon probably, that that Woody had Matt Damon had more of the liver, so uh, so the Woody looked older. But the his Woody's one uh, caution to Pete and Bobby was just just don't show me on the toilet. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to be shown on the toilet because there was a joke where one was on the on the toilet and the other one was sort of like there's a curtain and. <laughs> I, I just want you know I. I've tagged at this point when when we're speaking. I don't know what it'll be by the time that it airs. I've tagged Cher on social media, posted four hundred times asking her to appear here. So <laughs> <laughs> she was great. What a, what? I, and she she had. I I hope she had fun doing it. She was such a such a. She was so fun. I'll, I'll ask her if she ever appears. <laughs> What's that again? I'll ask her if she ever appears on the show. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> was, she, was, she was really to take that role and to 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 mock herself like that. She well, you know that that woman has an extraordinary sense of humor, huh. you know, and has always had a great sense of humor. Yeah. You know. I'm just trying to get over Woody Allen being in that. I know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. So you came back to Dumb and Dumber the World with the sequel, Dumb and Dumber Two. Yes. Now, how long have you been talking about a sequel and what finally made all of you decide to go ahead and do it? Uh, we hadn't been talking about a sequel. We, right after the first one, we were, we would love to have done one, but at that time, New Lime didn't want to pay, you know, Woody, uh, Jeff, Dan, Jim Carrey was getting, his prices right. were getting so <laughs> high and they didn't want to pay him that much money. So, so it just the whole idea of maybe doing it fell out because we can't afford him anymore, you know. Uh, by the way, his when he made the mask, I think he got seven hundred thousand dollars. And when we knew he was going to do Dumb and Dumber, we we told New Line, get him now, this is before the mask before the mask came out. 
And they said, no, let's wait to see how the mask does. And, and then, well, well, it was a huge hit and they only had to pay him 10 times that amount. They paid him $7 million instead of 700,000. <laughs> um, but uh, no, he called, Jim was in Hawaii and he was on vacation and he saw it on TV, Dumb and Dumber. He hadn't seen it in years. And he called Peter up, said, Pete, I watched it again last night. Damn it, 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 that's a funny movie. Let's do it. Let's do another one. And so it was Jim who initiated it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and that's how it got the ball rolling. And it was it was so much fun to write together, and it was just so much fun to film. And everyone, I was on set when Jeff Daniels he had just won. Uh, can I can I uh, curse on this show or not? Oh yeah, Dr. Summer, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He had just won the Emmy for the newsroom, and, and so and then the next day he flew on into the set for his first day, and uh, it was his birthday as well. And so we had a big birthday cake for him and everything. And he just plopped down in his chair and he clapped his hands together and said, "I just won an Emmy, so let's make this fucker now." And he, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you just yeah. touched on it, but how much fun was it really to revisit the characters and 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 film oh, with? those two again so much fun plus at this point pete and bobby had made so many movies and they liked they liked working with a lot of the same crew so it was, it's like a family you know and so everyone's back together again and and they 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 love each other jim and jeff love each other by the way it wasn't the easiest thing to get made warner Bro we were developing it at warner brothers uh and warner brothers wasn't pulling a trigger on it and and we had we we loved our script and, and so did Jim and Jeff and Warner Brothers wasn't green lighting it and it was pissing it really pissed Jim off because he was like you've got everything here you need what's taking you so long and so uh he almost he left he kind of left the project sort of but wasn't he was always he was always if, if we could set it up he was always going to make it so but it looked like he had walked away from it. And it was a part of it was probably, you know, just whatever the, the, what you go through in, in the, in the trying to get something made and, and try, you know, a faking out like a poker face sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> a bluffing sort of thing. But we had another company come in that was, they were two fans of the movie, the, the guys who, who had the company called Red Granite. And they said, we'll make this movie. And, and Universal said, and we'll distribute it very quickly so that's how it came about but it, it wasn't as smooth as you would have thought getting them back yeah. to you know so I, how they, as a, it was 20 years later and, and right. time did change you know i mean, I mean things change well, movies how movies get made and, and what movies get made well how about as a writer like 20 years after you do the original how difficult is it for you to put yourself back in that mindset again i need to revisit these characters that i haven't thought about for all this time it was a thrill and it, yeah. was, and it was, I wouldn't even say it was, a, let's say it was a quality problem because uh, it, was, it was so much fun to be thinking about them and, and thinking about them 20 years later and to get back in the, it was very, it was easy to get back in the mindset, actually, you know, it was, it, it wasn't at all difficult for us. We, we know those characters, we don't just know them well from having written the first one and having made the first one, but, you know, oh, over the years, the, the they they've sort of become iconic. I mean, I, I'm, I'm putting quotes around, but they're sort of iconic ca characters. So they kind of solidify into this thing that that's what they are. And, and what I noticed, and this is it's kind of fascinating to say this. Twenty years later, you know, people grew people who loved the movie and grew up with the movie. What happens is you you internalize the movie. It, it becomes it goes inside you and then it becomes your thing and, and your very personal thing. You know, the way you think about the characters, the way you relate to them. And so when Dumb and Dumber 2 came out, there were a lot of people who loved Dumb and Dumber 1 who felt like we weren't being true to the characters. Or, or And, and I, my interpretation of that was you just, you, you, you can't, what, what can you do? People internalize those characters and they make them, these, you know, they have this, they, they have a personal relationship with them. And so in their mind, there are things that they they would do and wouldn't do. 
And, and we just wrote the script based on what we thought as the original creators, those characters now would and wouldn't do, you know. And so, and so, some some people were uh, uh, dissatisfied with what we did, or I think also comedy. A, a comedy in 1994 is a bit different than a comedy in 2014. You know, uh, I mean, it's 20 years later, and so there are subtle things that do do change. And by the way, I don't. There are things in Dumb and Dumber I don't think we can get away with. If we oh, were to sure make, <laughs> sure. twenty four, just sure. astonishingly, you know, things we'd have to cut. Um, but the whole experience of making it was unbelievably fun. I, I like a joyful and a kick, and yeah, I had a great time. And, and I, I, I ended up being on the set a lot more, so much so that that Pete would constantly say, "Hey, Bennett, get it." Go get in the shot. Go go in the background, like like. <laughs> and so I'm I'm I am in the background and visible three times in the movie before the crew came to Pete and said, "Stop it! People are going to figure. <laughs> they're going to see Bennett three times. They're going to figure it." You can find me. The first time I'll say, two times I'm very I'm like facing camera visible, but the first time. I'm urinating against the side of the, their apartment building as they go by on a bike. So <laughs> I have to watch this again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but look for me. You will see me. I yeah. wasn't but, paying attention the first time. Now I'm going to look. It's yeah, ab red. absolutely. Um, I will send, I'll send you a nickel if you can. See <laughs> <laughs> well, the film had other people that were huge fans of, besides the Bill Murray cameo. Um, there was also Kathleen Turner and Bob Riggle. Um, can you tell some stories, you know, about them or, you know, anything else about the making of the film? Uh, Kathleen Turner, like Cher, was so game, you know, I mean, uh, you know, in, in the in the script, we actually described Freda Felcher as like a blousy, blown out Kathleen Turner type. I, I mean, like... <laughs> We literally insulted <laughs> Kathleen Turner <laughs> in the script. And that wonderful person was gracious enough to get the joke. And and, and she she said, honey, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that classic raspy Turner. She was happy to do it. Uh, Riggle was giddy to do it, too. I mean, because he, he loved Dumb and Dumber. And again, working with it's a it's such a fun set. It's just you know it's like it's 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 not a job. It's it's like a it's like playtime. So mm. everyone in, really loved being in it and doing it. Um, I just there was there was it was it was, a, it was such a yeah it was so much fun to watch. I'm trying to think of were there any. I'll probably remember something after. <laughs> we'll edit it later. <laughs> yeah. so. You also a co-writer on, you know, In the Blood with Gina Carano, Danny Trejo, and you know Luis Guzman, and the late Treat Williams. So, what, what can you tell us about that and some of the casts? Well, that's that. I wrote that not with Pete and Bobby, but with my other oh. writer, partner, James Johnson, who we worked on Unhitched with, and and then and, and Joyride too. Uh, and we like James and I, excuse me, both love genre. We're genre writers, so we. Love. I mean, we've done a Christmas family movie. We've done a, a straight-on horror movie. We've done a, a, thr a bloody thriller. We and in fact, we sold just days, hours before the strike last year. We sold a supernatural thriller that's being that goes into production next month in in uh, oh, fantastic. yeah, called Day of the Dead. So we're all over the place, you know. Um, and we've done comedy too, and and. So uh, we wanted to write like a just something that turns out like right now is very in vogue, and we wanted to write like a revenge thriller. There, there's so many of them now after Taken and and all that stuff. Um, and so uh, we wrote it, and I remember we 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 sent it to our managers, and they were like, "Really? Like like they were shocked that because they they were getting like family movies from us. We'd written." Uh, Hotel for Dogs, the sequel to Hotel for Dogs. We were hired to write Marley and Me too, which did, oh. didn't quite get done. So we were working in, and we were working on, on stuff for Nickelodeon TV movies. 
and we hand them this bloody revenge thriller, <laughs> and they're like, really? Uh, but it, it got set up, and it was uh, I wasn't there because they were they filmed it in Puerto Rico, and so I wasn't there. We weren't there for any of the filming of it, but uh, it was uh, it was just we liked it. It's very satisfying for us. So. Uh, and I and I'm 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 mixed about the movie. I think there's good things about it. That let's put it this way, and, you know, the, the all the, whenever it hewed to our script because it, it it had been rewritten, it had been changed a lot before it was shot. But whenever it hewed through this to the script, and of course every write every screenwriter is going to say this, but that's when it was best. You know, that's that's when it was good. And um, I'd always wanted. I, I liked uh, I liked um, zip lining, and I always wanted. To see like a, a, a suspense scene where a zip liner stops halfway, and and like their their the, the harness starts to to tear, and I said so so it was fun to put that in the movie, and that's an important part of the plot because uh, Gina Carano's husband uh, I don't I don't know if it's called he pronounced it Ga Gage or, Ga or Cam Gijane, but. Uh, he that's what happens. They're they're zip lining on their honeymoon and he gets stopped halfway and the harness rips and he falls and, and shatters his ankle and he gets taken off in an ambulance and she doesn't see him ever again. And and what what happened and, and her trying to find out what happened. And uh um, so uh I wish I could say more about the production of it, but uh I can't. <laughs> Except that <laughs> I'm glad it got made. And well, uh, on uh, on Facebook, you, you just posted something yesterday about the, pitching a project shortly yeah. after the Challenger. Like, yeah. oh my God, it'll be yeah. an unbelievable story. And you know, if you want to tell it, you can. I'll let you. But any other besides that one, and I'd love to hear that one. Any other memorable events that came upon that you, you remember about pitching project projects? Oh gosh, oh there's Jonathan. There's a lot, and some of them I. I, I uh, <laughs> if I can get away with this, yeah, oh, I, don't, I, don't, don't. You don't have you to. Can, you, you don't. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell it, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take names out of it. Okay, so <laughs> one of the very first times when Peter and I, we, so we come out to Hollywood and we're meeting people now, and we have agents and everything. And one of our very first meetings. We're supposed to meet a big producer. Okay, yeah, I can be completely anonymous with this one. And uh, and so we're shown into his office and we're told that he's driving back from Vegas. So he's going to be late, but he's on his way, should be here soon. So we just sat in the office and we're chatting. And um, okay, this is it. I'm gonna I'm gonna commit to this. But I'm not saying his name. The guy comes into the office and uh, finally, I mean, I think we were there like 45 minutes, you know, and like, should we leave? Or finally comes in, we're there. And he's like, hey, guys, I, 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 so lying to me, dude. I don't like this way. <laughs> and we realized very quickly that he's extremely high on cocaine because he can't, there, there's not a sentence he can complete or articulate <laughs> clearly enough. For, so right away, we're into a lot of nodding because that's what you, you know, it, it, at least it moves the conversation. It seems like we're answering and it moves the conversation <laughs> forward somehow. Uh, and he's, oh, that's right. I'm, and I'm not, this is, an, I, this is what it sounded like. So then I mean, you know, and, I, and, I, and when we were making us, I was trying to make it. And, it's, and he goes, <laughs> I remember he goes into the bathroom. He had a bathroom in in the the office and opens the door. And now he's talking to us as he's urinating. It's just calling out, you know, with the door open. And then, oh yeah, so I, I read his really gonna... And then he comes back in and sits in his chair. And over the course of the next twenty minutes, and, and I don't know how we managed to to fashion <laughs> replies because we weren't sure what he was saying. He starts to slip down in the chair, like 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 and he's still talking to him. <laughs> and to the point where now his shirt is hiked. He's almost on the floor. His shirt is hiked up, <laughs> and that was uh, one of our first meetings. This is this uh, is the time I normally ask the name rhymes with 
<laughs> oh yeah, no. The thing about it is, the man is no longer alive. Oh, uh, we won't. We won't. I, would, I wouldn't. Uh, yeah. No yeah. Oh, and he was the God. manager of uh, of a lot of famous comics. Uh, the glamorous life of Hollywood. Wow. Yeah. I, I really I could write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention the name. Well, uh, what what are you working on next? I you know what. I'm not working on anything right now. It's it's weird. I kind of at the end. I sort of semi. I kind of semi retired from screenwriting from in the industry at the kind of at the about around. Here's what happened. I'll I'll give you the short version. I I, I pretty much done. I I I've been relatively successful, and I'd done all the things I kind of wanted to do as a screenwriter. I didn't have any goals or anything that uh, other than like just writing something else getting hired for something else and, and I, I wasn't and the industry has changed so much at this point now we're into it's comic book movies it's superhero it's superhero movie and that's i felt like i learned how to craft a lovely leather sandal and now all that they're making are sneakers. That that's really kind of how I felt. <laughs> and I could make a I, I I could figure out how to make a sneaker, but I, I'm also aging out of it. You know, I mean, they 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 want to hire young writers, and they should. I mean, because that's that's how it's done. You know, I'm ready to move off and let some young young buck take over, enthusiastic and full of ideas. And, and and as when I was a kid, I had two fantasies. One was I wanted to write movies. That was actually a, a fantasy of mine. Uh, I never thought I'd end up doing it ever, but I got to do it, which is astonishing to actually have your fantasy dream come true. The other fantasy, as a kid, I grew up here in Southern California, and I loved Disneyland, and I loved the rides. And I love the idea of, of being an Imagineer. I mean, back then there wasn't, there were no other amusement parks. There was Knott's Berry Farm we had here, but but you know, there, amusement parks were not an international or even a national industry. Um, and and so I was like, well, I could never do that. I mean, I knew I, I knew what my talents were in in writing, and I'd see on the wonderful world of Disney. Walt Disney would introduce one of the Imagineers and they'd show how they made the Haunted Mansion. I'm like, I, I don't know how they did. It, again, it was like a magic show to me. It was like, I want to be on that side of the curtain. <clears throat> um, but I knew it could never happen. But then in uh, in 2019, I, I called a friend of mine who now, they call it uh, themed entertainment, that industry. Uh, <laughs> I have a friend who works in themed entertainment and he had just gotten back from helping to build a $4 billion amusement park in uh, in the United Arab Emirates called the Warner Brothers World, uh, War, in Abu Dhabi, uh, Warner Brothers World. And I called him up and I said, Taylor, is there a reality, like, you know, I'm a screenwriter, but do screenwriters ever work in themed entertainment? He said, Bennett, of course they come. Yes, of course they do. Every attraction, no matter what it is, has to be written. I mean, there, there's a there's a writer involved in the process, and I was like, really? <laughs> that just got me excited because I thought, if I, I mean, is it possible? Oh. Could I make my second fantasy a reality? And so I, that's what I did. At the end, at, in twenty, at the end of twenty eighteen, I told my writing partner James, you know what? I I, I got to try this. I mean, I just have to, and see what happens. And so. I lit out and and went in 2019. I started, and you know, day one was okay. You have to meet everybody in your industry. So, so it wasn't difficult to fashion an email that said, "Hi, my name is Bennett Yell. I'm the co-writer of Dumb and Dumber." You know, that email got me virtually every meeting that I hopefully I wanted oh. to have, including meetings at a meeting in Imagineering at Disney. And then it was just a matter of meeting everybody and letting being on their radar and letting them know I'm here to help write your pro, you know to be the writer on your project. And one company called Super Seventy Eight, I met them and they were like, well, Dumb and Dumber is one of our the owners are um, Dina Benedon and Brett. Oh God, I'm gonna forget their names, but they they were a married couple who owned the company. 
They said, Dumb and Dumber is one of our favorite movies. Come on in. I met them. It was kismet. We all loved each other. And they were in the middle of, they had a project. There was an aquarium in Galveston, Texas, and they had a 4D movie attraction. A 4D is not, it's more than three. It's like, it's more than 3D. You're watching the movie and maybe a, a leak springs on the screen and you feel the water. That's that's the 4D part of it. <laughs> and, and so it was themed to SpongeBob SquarePants and the, the aquarium was losing, they were only renting that IP uh, of SpongeBob. So they were gonna lose the IP and they had to re-theme this 4D theater experience. And so they had, they smartly managed to settle on 20,000 leagues under the sea because it's in the public domain. So the company, uh, um super 78 they were hired to retheme it and so uh they had to write a whole new script for it and everything like that and they and they said we want to hire you to 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 write to basically punch up put comedy into into the attraction and that's what i did i actually worked on that's that fantastic. in 2019 yes and i had i, I it was a thrill i mean i would come wow. in and, we would laugh so hard at the meetings as I pitched the jokes and everything like that. We had so much fun. And then going into, so that, that actually opened, I think in no, like November of 2019. And then I had all this momentum and I was on the radar for a couple other projects. And then something happened at the beginning of 2020. It's called oh COVID. <laughs> and it completely I had so much momentum and it completely oh my. like hitting a brick wall, you know, and for set for a couple of years, you know. And so I I I once the industry started opening up again, I was like, you know, it took me like a whole year to be on everyone's radar because that's the way you get the work is mm -hmm. is like, oh, we just met with Bennett and we need somebody, you know. And I was like, I don't I, you know, maybe you should just retire. And that's kind of that was the choice I made. I said, you know what? By, and, and sort of kind of retired um like in 2022 so i'm sort of i am i mean i i, I i'm retired i got a pension uh, and all that and that and, and things pop up you know scripts that we wrote that didn't get sold or anything they pop up like like day of the dead you know the mm -hmm. producer of that contacted us like we, he had he was circling around it he had read it and he really liked it and it was and then he finally optioned it and then a few months later the strike was gonna it was days before the strike was gonna happen and he took us out for for breakfast and he said guys is there gonna really be a strike and we said yeah it seems like it's happening so he said well then i want to buy day of the dead because he wanted to make it last year you know if he owned it he could do whatever he wanted with it so he did buy it uh and um and but it got postponed. The production got postponed until now. So it's going into production. Oh. Yeah. You, are you open to doing things with the Farrelly's again? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's so, it's, it's, it, it, yeah, it's a joy. I mean, I would never, I would never say no to them because they're friends and it's also so much fun to just get together and create. Yeah. So, and, I, and in fact, and I will also say, I'm open, the phone rings. And it's something I couldn't possibly, you know, it's a producer I worked with years ago who said, like, Bennett, we've got a project that you seem like you're perfect for. Are you interested? And I, I'm open to all sorts of things. In fact, my my James Johnston, who I wrote uh, Day of the Dead with, we got a call from somebody who said, and this was so not in our wheelhouse, in our house of wheels, we got a call and they, they said, we are a company that we take IPs like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and we produce stage, family stage shows. Mm -hmm. And so we've been hired by, um, I can't remember the company that owns the IP for uh, Angry Birds and they want an Angry Birds stage show. Um, do you want to come in and, and talk about it and audition for it? And we said, that's just weird. So here, I had not even played Angry Birds on my phone. Like I, I had no idea what it was, but there were two, um, they did two animated, very popular animated movies. 
Um, and so we watched them and the movies were really funny. Like the script was very funny. Like I, I, they made me laugh hard. And so I, we came back and said, if you want to do what's in the movies on stage, we would love to, to audition for it. And we auditioned and we got it and we wrote it. Um, and, and we wrote the Angry Birds, I think it's called Slingshot Adventure. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what's going to happen with it, but it came out great and it was so much fun. Gosh, I can't believe, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the company that owns the, the rights to it, but we were very honored because we thought the screenplay, we thought both movies were just really funny. And then the first time, the first call we had with the company, it's a, it's a Norwegian company that owns the rights. They said, guys, your script is the funniest first draft we've ever of any project we've ever read. And we were very, very flattered. It came out That's great. True. It was fun. So I'm, I'm the bottom line is this guy is this guy with the thumbs that wait, <laughs> I do this. Wait a minute. Hold on. It. Bring it on. Bring on the explosion. <laughs> uh it's ready for anything. It's open to anything. Oh, no, except. It's not oh, July fourth anymore. Oh, what 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 advice can you offer to aspiring screenwriters? Uh, <laughs> quit quit while you're ahead. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> it's just going to be frustrating, and <laughs> it's like well, it's so competitive. And no, no, it's exactly the opposite. And and it's if you, no one's going to believe in you unless you believe in you first. And you have to have the ultimate confidence in yourself. And that means you can't give up. You can't give because because everyone else, not everyone else, but so many other people are going to drop off. They are going to give up. And when they do that, you rise up. You, you actually rise up. And the possibility of you getting that job becomes more because 10 people just walked away. So so believe in yourself. And if you, and, and truly believe in yourself and, and, and it will help others believe in you. And then don't give up. Do not give up. And then make sure uh, that there's someone in your life who has an enormous amount of money who can uh, <laughs> support you while all this is happening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and give me their number as well. So how, how can people follow you on social media? I, I guess I'm on, you know, I'm so not a social, but I am on Instagram. Yeah, right. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram and, and stuff like that. You know, it's it's I'm not able to I, I've never I can't like read somebody's script, much less even if I read it and liked the number of times over the course of my career where I read a friend's script and I read it because they were friends of mine right, right, right. and 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 a liked the script. And then B liked it so much that I gave it to my my agents to like, you know, like maybe they represent them. That happened twice. <laughs> over all over decades and the agents didn't represent them so uh <laughs> like I, i'm not the person who can get but but i i can't read scripts anymore and also like it, get, like it blows my mind that eddie murphy did and, and that the zuckers did because when you read a script you become potentially liable to like mm -hmm. legally liable like someone could say oh i sent bennett yellen my script and then there was a scene in there where there's a turkey in a bathroom and there was a turkey in a bathroom in his movie and and so and sue you, you yeah know? yeah so you're, my attorney is like you can never say yes never do it again <laughs> well Bennett, thank you so much for coming on today it was such a pleasure getting to talk to you and hear your stories uh so much fun <laughs> absolutely you guys were both great i i, I am a fan of yours so, so if i had a podcast you'd be on it and, and <laughs> oh, that's almost the same questions very uh, very kind of you <laughs> but this was a blast i i really appreciate it and, and and thank you and yeah and look be on the lookout for unless they change the title to um godfather part four for uh day of the dead <laughs> yes <laughs> or dumb and dumber tree or so, i don't know <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, this has been Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And again, a very special thanks to Bennett Yellen. And please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast. 